Welcome to Salon Talks. I am Mary Elizabeth Williams, and this is a really, really special day for me personally, and I hope you as well. It has been 37 years since Jim Henson's iconic The Dark Crystal debuted, and since then it's become a touchstone for fantasy film fans. Now, at long last, the prequel series is debuting on Netflix to take us back to the world of Thra, and it is in extremely good hands. Uh, we've got here with us, what, what, sorry, first of all, let me give you some of the cast. Helen, like if you love Game of Thrones, if you love the Harry Potter world, just assume that the entire cast of them are in are you giving their voice. <laughs> a little Star Wars tip. And some, oh my God, <laughs> Mark Hamill is in, Helena Bonham Carter. We could go on all day. So I am sitting next to Lisa Henson. She's an executive producer on the show. She's also the CEO and the president of the Jim Henson Company. And next to her, we've got Louis Leterrier. I hope I said that. I was going to say, I was like, well pronounced. I was letting you finish your sentence. Well, I, I did take French in high school. <laughs> well, it shows. <laughs> Louis de Terrier is the director. He has helmed several recent hits, including Now You See Me, which I love, <laughs> Clash of the Titans, and the first two Transporter films. Okay. Hi, welcome. Hi. Okay, so I'm in love and obsessed with this series in a way that really surprised me because it's so engrossing on its own. It's such a beautiful piece of storytelling, and I think for anyone who is familiar with the Henson verse in general, it just hits you in the gut so hard because it's so faithful to the look and feel of of the original film and it just is a beautiful it's nostalgic but it's also so modern and fresh so congratulations on that wow you. that's <laughs> exciting it was so, that's so touching what you just said I like the Henson verse I can, <laughs> never use it yeah, yeah, yeah this is great let's I, use it <laughs> I just made I just made it up so I want to start with you Lisa because this this world has been part of your life for so 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 long your father had the ideas for this and began thinking about the original Dark Crystal almost 10 years before the movie was made. Can you talk a little about what the origins for this mm -hmm. really unique, special, strange world were and the story was? Yes, he actually worked for years, as you said, in just like pure R&D, you know, just working with the designer Brian Froud, who's an illustrator whose work he absolutely loved. And he brought Brian to New York and just started with the puppet workshop and Brian kind of just experimenting with different types of puppetry techniques, how to translate this illustrative look into design. And you know, he had something so unusual t that doesn't exist today is he had a, a financial benefactor named Lou Grade who essentially gave him a blank check for, for development. And so this, one of the reasons the world of the Dark Crystal today is so rich and well worked out is because they had years to work on it before they even really worked out the script. So the script was one of the last things to fall in place on the original Dark Crystal. Now we're able to kind of fall back on all that world building. You know, it's like, it's actually a classic world building. People talk a lot about world building now creatively, but you know, to have a have an exciting fantasy world, you really do have to have a believable and convincing world for it to take place in. So yeah, they had, and all the techniques that we, that became like the sort of main animatronic techniques of the 80s and 90s, all that was really developed for the Dark Crystal. And that animatronics workshop was the first of its kind, and they, they kind of built everything that we needed today to make the show was done in that blue sky period. Wow, yeah, it's, I mean, it really is, it's a groundbreaking film on so many ways, and then this becomes another groundbreaking achievement. So all of that work certainly had an impression on you. I want to ask, so I know this is, a <laughs> this is your origin story. It's my origin story. Right? So t talk a little bit about the impact that this the book of it and the and the uh, film had on you. Well, the story, yeah, the the the, it's a movie and it's sort of a relationship that a lot of people have with the movie. It's sort of, we all saw this movie, not expecting to see something that immense and beautiful and quite jarring. It was so scary in a sense that we it it, it hit and struck us in, in me. I'll speak for myself in a place that sort of like completely rewired my <laughs> sort of like, you know, artistic uh, and, you know, storytelling ability. Uh, you know, everybody ha is a storyteller. We are born storytellers. But this, I, this film where there were clearly no 
actors, uh, but it was clearly tactile. It was not a cartoon that, you know, when I was young, there was no CG, but it was either cartoon world building, comic book, uh, or, or movie world building. You know, Star Wars was out, but then this was all puppets, all practical, tactile, and yet you understood it was that, but yet you forgot completely that you were watching puppets, and then you entered, entered this world, and frankly, for myself, I never left it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, as I was saying earlier, you know, you watched this this new series, and it seems so strange. And then within two minutes, you're just in it, yeah. and oh. everything about it is believable, and you're invested in these characters, even though you you know they're puppets, but it still is very real to you. So, what was it like getting getting the gig and getting to do this? I mean, did you have to <laughs> lobby really hard and say, "I, I am the only no, person"? No, we love him. He didn't have to lobby hard. <laughs> No, it was very good. No, thank you. She <laughs> never had to love you. I ne never had to love you really hard. It was it was a dream. You know, you come to Hollywood. I come from France. I'd done a couple of movies that were successful. I'd never done a f French movie in France. I was doing almost like fake American movies in France, and then they were successful, and that opened the you know the doors of great big Hollywood producers. And so my agent says, "Oh, so who do you want to meet? Steven Spielberg?" Everybody, and I was like, no, "I'd love to meet my childhood hero." Or actually his kids, you know, and we had an amazing, what you call in Hollywood general meeting, where you talk about everything and how you grew up and what you fell in love with. It was sort of like this conversation. And then very quickly, I explained to Lisa that I'd done this movie, Clash of Titans, we just talked about uh, Greek mythology, lots of creatures, world, bu world building, and textures. And I was showing my crew, because it's a movie I loved, Dark Crystal, every time somebody New was starting on the on, on the show. I was saying on the movie. I was saying, watch the Dark Crystal. This is you know what I'd love to do. And so I tell this to Lisa, and Lisa said, well, but, you know, we've been actually trying to do a sequel for a few years. Would you like to? Would you be interested? Would you like to maybe part, partner with us and try to put it, um, you know, make it a reality? So immediately accepted. Kick myself afterwards, like, oh no! Because imagine if I'm the guy who ruins the crystal. <laughs> like, yes. No, you stupid Frenchman! You know, what did you say? Yes, what did you say? Yes. So that was a 19, nine years ago, and we started working on it. Kept working very hard, and like Lisa said, it's yes, it's a wonderful world, but it starts with an idea, starts with a with a script, and we started developing the script, and then. And then you know we kept going, kept going, kept going, and then and then Netflix, Netflix came. So Netflix <laughs> said uh, that they were interested in doing a, you know, a ten-part series, and they asked us, could we make the series look like the feature film? And we were that was really the like shocking moment. We were like, are we really going to have the possibility of you know show, doing that much? Dark Crystal, like not just the feature film that we had been talking about, but a big premium television show with a huge, you know, sweeping story. And uh, actually, our you know our executives at Netflix, from Cindy Holland to Ted Biaselli, Carolina Garcia, they are like they're the ones who we can really credit for having made this a possibility mm -hmm. because it was a pretty brave move to green lights, you know, this kind of project that nobody's doing anything like this. Anywhere, <laughs> it is so, you can just see the ambition yeah. in in every in every minute of it, and I wanna I wanna talk about that. I was talking to someone this morning about the series, and I said I'd seen some of it, and he said, "Oh, I'm sure it's great, but the, you know, it must be like all CGI." And I said, "Oh no!" Do you go, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh -uh, au contraire. <laughs> and I want to. Now I, you see that French kicking. Oh, in. there it is. It's that high school friend. <laughs> high school um, friend. I can order off a menu too. We can do that later. Uh, so let's talk about this. It was a really important priority to have this as authentic as possible. Mm. Even though you are using a lot of modern techniques, mm. you are using some effect, modern effects. There's, there's a scene, I will just say there's a pink tree in the first episode that just psh, will blow your mind. <laughs> uh, but it was also really important to keep it authentic. And that is, that is a two-pronged job. The, the, the puppets are all real. That's mm. important to mm. say. You had kept original materials, even from the, the London space where other things had been sent mm -hmm. off to museums, but these really peripheral kind of materials. Yeah, we were able to find plans of the the sets and, and the original and, and props that had been built and of course all of our puppets were, you know, in archives and able to be referenced. So yeah, archivally we were able to really support this. Because you felt that somewhere along the way 
there would you would be you would be called again that you were oh i've been planning it i've been planning for like 15 years to do something like either a dark crystal sequel or a prequel and when we actually when we closed our creature shop in in camden in london we had so much in storage and everybody was like you just have to get rid of as much of what's in storage as possible and i said yeah but not anything from dark crystal like we're keeping everything, and and you know it's been it's been really really great that we did because that stuff still sparked joy, right? You didn't <laughs> have to con Mari it out of the. That's amazing. I mean, and you and you built them, so the puppets were built based on these originals and referencing them. Some are. I mean, some come back, but yeah. we have right. a much much bigger cast, like right. seventy five puppets and so many Gelflings where there were originally only two. So, I mean, it's key to the whole thing that we brought Brian Froud back, who is our true genetic, you know, mm -hmm. line to the original Dark Crystal film. Yeah, and I was who designed say, like, say, everything. And say who he was for people who, um, well, just you tell who us. Who, Brian Froud? I, I know who he, because I've read it, but it's a, it's a really well, sweet no, story. You're talking about, well, Brian and Wendy. So Brian Froud is the designer. Wendy Froud is his wife. They actually met. It's a beautiful love story. They met on the original movie. They fell she's, in love. She's, he designed everything, painted it. She sculpted the Gelfling character. She made them pretty. He loves scary. <laughs> she loves pretty. The two of them are perfect. They made a child. <laughs> this child is named Toby Froud. Little Toby Froud is the baby from Labyrinth, the mm -hmm. one that gets thrown around <laughs> by David Bowie. And Wendy, Brian, and Toby worked on our Dark Crystal show, and it was an incredibly fluid relationship, and everything came through them, mm -hmm. you know, from the idea through them and onto the set, and it was just an incredible relationship. Yeah. And you. Oh. Went to sorry. Oh. You went what to was puppet. it? Oh, it's the tape. Yeah. The tape. Oh. You went to puppetry school, or you took some yeah, puppetry yeah, lessons. School, yeah. Now, why was that important for you to do Did that? You? Well, no. Well, I mean, you put me through puppet school. <laughs> I think he means the whole show was oh. puppetry school. Well, you know? but, but, I, but it's but it's true. Like I, I I had done obviously a lot of movies before, but um, uh, you know, puppetry is a completely different art. I mean, something that you cannot. You have an idea of how it's done, but you have, but you know if you do take a deep dive into this world, you just realize you know nothing. So so that's what we did. And then Netflix again, Lisa's right. We need to give credit to our executives because executives you never see their names anywhere. But without them, there wouldn't be a show. There wouldn't be this show. There wouldn't be me because they understood. They loved it and understood what needed to happen. And and Cindy Holland. Um, uh, uh, told us, why don't you shoot a little test? Because we know what the Dark Crystal will look like, mm -hmm. we know what uh, the Critter Shop, uh, Hanson's Critter Shop, how amazing their puppets are, we know what it looks like, we know what Louis, your movies look like, and your, your the dynamic, ver you know, your dynamic approach to scenes. But how does the two work together? Do a little test. And they, so we're like, okay, well, no, we'll do a couple of shots, maybe use a, no, build a full, build a full puppet, do a full little you short film. A, a, yeah, a test that would give the full look and feel of the show. Yep. So that was a, that was a big investment. That was a big investment. That yeah. was an incredibly small investment. Uh, we all learned. Me, I learned the most, but uh, we all learned what needed to be done. What I we all learned. We had, we, had a, we had some ideas about blending in more CG than we ended up using on the show, and mm. we realized that actually wasn't a good idea, and that what would look the best would be all puppets, you know. Yeah, we it was we, sort went, of like, we yeah. went for more puppets on screen after doing our test. Yeah, and it, it has, there's just a, I don't know, there's something, there, it just has the right texture, ultimately. So, well, so it's, it's about textures, and it's very much about performance. Uh, uh, we realized also during, uh, when shooting the show, that we needed to put together an incredible set of puppeteers, our main cast of puppeteers, because they are the people that not only will bring those characters to life, but everything you see on screen is alive thanks to mm -hmm. them. From the plants to the birds to the, the, tr the trees, because we all shot on stage. We shot in a little industrial stage in you know, south of London for a year. Nothing was shot outside, so you have to imagine just bringing life to everything. That's the job of the puppeteers. That's something that I learned from you, Lisa, because you know, when casting, when casting, I was like, yeah, let's just get the people that are available. She's like, no, 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 no. These people, <laughs> this person is great for this, this person is great for that. And we put together, you know, you put together yeah, we for found me. Yeah, we incredible this. puppeteers who are so subtle and they're, they have such nuanced abilities. And many of these puppeteers 
were not the lead puppeteers in other shows. It's they're not the most of them are not the leads from the Muppets or they they have very special almost like like a magical ability to bring emotion in the most delicate way to their puppets. And some of the puppeteers were kind of shocked that they even got the leads. They were not expecting it. And suddenly they realized they were going to have 10 episodes on their shoulders. But they all came through incredibly. But it was really their, they were in, intuitive, really special, special mm -hmm. performers. That, And I, I know you appreciated that. Yeah. you know, the emotions that the puppets are able to show. Well, the, the, the combination of, of these very beautiful, the physicality of the puppets, and then you have just the absolute A-list of these actors giving the voice to them, and it, it winds up, like I said, you just you get pulled into this world, and you're like, yep, I, I completely believe it. Now, I want to ask you about that, because I'm someone who is familiar with this world, who comes into it with not just a knowledge of it, but a feeling, a real emotion for it. You're also going to be introducing this world to entirely new people who know nothing about it. And you have this very strong fan base who've really been the biggest part of why this movie has endured. It was not a huge hit when it first came out. It has become only bigger and bigger through the years. Mm -hmm. It has a very strong fan base, and then you have people who have absolutely no idea what the hell this is. <laughs> How do you tell a story that allows for both of them to have different experiences but come into it with with a sense of like I understand what's happening. Well it's really our writers. We have a great writing team um, and they they came to just this assignment as opposed to having been on the the movie that we were developing or part of the Henson Company, they came from sort of that outside perspective to develop this TV series. And I think they kept in mind in a really good way how to develop lead characters that would bring you into the world. So they, they focused on three lead characters that come from very different backgrounds. And the I think the first episode and the second one, and actually we really want people to watch one and two together, but um, those episodes sort of, I think they have each of those characters as a point of entry for the world, so you don't really have to know mm -hmm. everything about it before you see it. You can hopefully just hook into, you know, these young, these young pe people, not people, young Gelfling and what they're trying to achieve. Right, you have, you, and you have your narrator at the beginning, who gives you a little bit of background, and plus, because it's a prequel, you don't, you can come into it like this is a new story for sure, absolutely. And I will just tell you, um, there's no way you can watch the end of episode one and not just say, all right, I'm, I'm in for the next one. <laughs> like that's, a, that's Wait, impossible. it's Netflix, it's hard for you to turn it up. <laughs> right. like, oh, no, it's already playing. Right. It's like, yeah, absolutely, that's a big part of it. So um, I just want to ask you one more thing because as I was watching it, it's, it's this classic story, it's this world that really began back in the 70s, and yet, when you see this story and you see that it's about hope and it's about resistance, it's about misinformation, it's about the threat of darkness, it's about the, the environment itself, it feels extremely resonant and topical. I guess and that's it, why we're on Salon, right? I, that, <laughs> may, it might have something to do with why we invited you here, although it's also the puppets for sure. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? About like what is it about this story that feels so so resonant right now and feels like it is? It's both classic and yet super super modern. Well, so quickly, but the themes were there then, thirty seven years ago. We just expanded on the themes, but it's it's it, the idea of preserving a planet, finding the balance, respecting each other. These these were. These were the themes that were close to Jim Henson and Brian Farad's heart, and then they, they, they followed through with it and created this movie that almost is the exclamation point at the, at the end of a long sentence. We just had to fill the gap, right? And that's the... Yeah, and also because we are in, in a fantasy world that allows us to be a little big in our metaphors, you know? And I, I like the idea that you said all of that about what you you read into the, the meaning of the series. But also, we really just have to tell an engaging story and then allow people to find their own you know, metaphors in there. I mean, it's a, it's a world where the Gelfling are threatened by really bad villains. I mean, the Skeksis are extraordinary villains. And you know, they're, they're becoming aware. And so a lot of what the 
what the show deals with is awareness and like when you become aware of what's happening like what should you do and I think it's a great like conversation starter for families who watch the show together and we really feel the show is also we didn't talk about this but we really think the show is great for family viewing you know there are a bit of spooky things for little kids but if they're watching with parents there is um, this is a good way to kind of process dark darkness and dark things because it's not it's not too, it's not really adult in that sense. It's yeah. not too dark. Yeah, it's it's fantasy, and and I really love also that it is about the truth and about finding the truth mm -hmm. and who is telling the truth and who is misleading you, mm -hmm. and that feels um, that feels a really important thing to teach our kids. Um, and can you rely on what you are being told? regardless of who it comes mm -hmm. from, uh, but also it's really, it really feels really resonant for us as well right yeah. now. Yeah. The spooky nature of it was important for me to keep and then expand upon a little bit, actually. We made it a little scary, <laughs> but for kids, but it's a good thing because that's when kids ask their parents why and want to open up to them and, and, and that's a relationship I've had with fables when I was growing up, to scary movies when I was growing up, and or books, and that's what we want to, to for, for, for the, the families to experience. It's, it's, it's really a show to experience together, to stop and maybe have a conversation. Stop after two episodes, have a conversation. That's the idea. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, stop after, but you can't stop after the first one. That no, no, no. Absolutely, <laughs> for sure. Okay, I'm going to say the name of it one more time because it's. I want to get the full name because it's really important because it is Jim Henson's The Dark Crystal, Age of Resistance. It airs on Netflix starting August 30th. You can watch all 10 episodes in a row if you want to just want. stay up all day, all night. <laughs> That's, be a tough just maybe hit pause a few times for bathroom breaks. Um, but it is absolutely incredible. Thank you both so much, Lisa Henson. Thank you. Louis Leterrier. Louis you. Leterrier. Oh, so good. Your French <laughs> is getting so good. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute thrill. Thank you very much.